Hi everyone, David A. Cox here with PCClassesOnline.com and today we are talking about Pixelmator. Pixelmator actually won the Mac app of the year back in 2011. It's a fantastic little piece of software, it's really inexpensive, and for anyone out there who wants to be able to either create their own custom graphics, or if you want to touch up your photos and go a little bit beyond what you can certainly do in iPhoto, then this is going to be the software for you. Now this class is being done live. If any of you are watching this after the fact and would like to join one of our live classes, we do them twice a week typically. Uh, you can find out all of the information on our website at pcclassesonline.com, which as always is a free public service. So that's all everyone. Let's get to Pixelmator. Hello everyone and welcome to the class. This is David A. Cox here with PCClassesOnline.com. We are, we are recording live right now. We have an audience tuning in from all over the world. We have people from all over the United States, uh, Canada, the UK, a uh, few other countries that I am not seeing here on my screen right at this moment. Today we are going to be talking about the app Pixelmator. This is definitely one of my favorite uh, photo image manipulation apps out there. Uh, this app actually won the Mac app of the year back in 2011, and they've just kind of improved it and just made it even better since then. For those of you who are not familiar with Pixel, uh, Pixelmator, it's a little bit like a hybrid sort of between uh, Photoshop Elements and maybe Lightroom, more towards the Photoshop Elements side of things. Um, one of the reasons why I love it is, you'll see here, it's $29, and they have all these updates all the time. I found it to be incredibly reliable. For the people here who do attend the classes and join the website, that graphic that you see uh, before every video where it kind of gives you the, the starting image, I design all of those in Pixelmator. And I just find it's so easy to just whip up a graphic, um, just very easy to manipulate your image, whatever it is. One of the things I did here before we started recording today, I asked the live audience here just to kind of give me an idea of what kind of images they are looking to work with. The vast majority of them were interested in learning how to just kind of touch up their photos, enhance them a little bit. So that's definitely what we're going to be focusing on today. I am going to touch on some stuff for graphic designers. So let's say, for example, you have a small business that you own and you want to be able to create your own little simple poster. I'm going to show you how to do that too. Uh, we're just not going to focus so much on that, but you will find that in the class today. As you can see here, you buy the app Pixelmator through the Mac App Store. So that would be you just go to the Apple icon here at the top left of your Mac, go into App Store, and you can just type into the little search bar up here at the top right, Pixelmator. Um, but it's a great little uh, app. Another feature that I really love about it is if you go to Pixelmator's website, which is very simply pixelmator.com, you'll find that they have a ton of tutorial videos. So, and what's great about them is they're really short. So they'll say, hey, you want to learn how to replace the color on a flower, for example, make a blue flower red. They'll show you in a three minute video how to do that. Not all the tutorials are video, some of them are step-by-step -step directions, but they do a really good job with them, very impressed, and uh, I applaud them for that. So make sure you check out their website too, because you'll find a ton of little tips and tricks out there. So um, let's uh, start, I'm going to go into Pixelmator right here, okay? First thing it's going to do is it's going to ask me if I want to open an image. Now one thing you will notice here right off the bat is that Pixelmator does talk to iCloud. So it's a very handy feature for those of you out there who have multiple computers. You can start working on an image in your office, save it to iCloud, go to your home laptop or desktop, pull it up, good to go. Okay, so it's definitely very handy as far as not having to store all the files in Dropbox or Google Drive or you know even a flash drive theoretically and have to move it around constantly. So for now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to click down here where it says new document and you'll notice that we have a whole bunch of different uh, presets here that you have. And you can also create custom presets, which we'll show you in just a moment here. So we have your standard screen resolutions up here at the very top, okay? Different sizes here that'll be handy. Uh, in this case, this here is inches, two by three, four by six, five by seven, eight by 10. Uh, at the end of the last class, someone was asking how to make a postcard. That's why it was set to that. For now, I'm actually gonna go to five by seven. That's what I really like working with. Uh, the resolution is just simply how clear is this image gonna be? 
personally, my rule of thumb is I always keep it at 300 resolution pixels per inch. Um, it's just a very easy to work with resolution and it's uh, very clear. You'll notice here we do have a little gear icon and with pretty much everything on the Mac, the gear usually refers to settings of some sort. So you'll see here that you can create a unique size. Let's say you don't need it to eight by 10, but you need eight and a half by 11. You could manually punch that in here, click here and hit save preset. Just an easy way to do that for you. Let's click okay. Okay, and we've got our little windows. One of the things all of our members I think are pretty much used to at this point is I always love to throw in a whole bunch of little tips and tricks over the course of the class. And the one I want to show you right now, right off the bat, even though it might sound a little bit out of order, is really handy as you start to use this more and more. So you'll notice that we have three real toolbars up here. We have our tools, our real toolbar. We have over here on the right hand side, we have our layers. So as we start to add layers of graphics, that's where we're going to see it over there. And we have an effects browser, also very, very handy. I have noticed that, and maybe it's because I misclicked, it's possible, but every once in a while I'll come in here and it's like, wait a minute, where's all my tools? They're gone. You know, they're just gone. So I want to give you a really, really easy hotkey combination to bring them all back. There's three main toolbars. Command 1, Command 2, Command 3. So on your keyboard, if you hit Command 1, boom, your toolbar comes back. Command 2, your layers comes back. Command 3, effects. I don't remember what 4 is. Oh, 4 is brushes. We can get rid of that for now. So just a really handy little trick I wanted to throw out there because for me, when I learned that trick, it was like, oh, that's easy. I like that. Easy is good. So what I want to do is I have a few images uh, that we're going to be kind of playing with here. We're not really going to be touching up a lot of these photos. My main goal is to teach you just how some of these different tools work. So I think what we're going to do is I'm going to start with pulling up this image. Those of you who've gotten to know me through this, you know I have a little aerial drone that I fly all over Cape Cod, which is where we're based out of. I'm actually taking a little short flight tonight. For those of you who happen to follow me on Facebook, you'll see that. Later on, I think it's going to be a pretty cool image. So I'm just kind of shrinking down the image here. Don't worry, I'll show you how to do all this in just a moment. Okay, so let's go. Just move these off to the side. So the first thing we have here at the top right of my tools is your arrow. If you need to move around an image, you'll notice you can just click and drag it around your canvas. Okay, you see how the background right now here is this like checkerboard image? That is not real. Okay, when you see a checkerboard pattern, uh, it basically means that right now the image is a transparency. So if I was to turn right now this graphic here and into a JPEG, for example, that checkerboard would be replaced with white. So anytime you see checkerboard, it means it's really transparent. It's white. Okay, so what you can do with the arrow key is you saw me just now when I first dragged this image in, it blew it up. It was giant and I needed to resize it. Really easy way to do it is, and this may be a little bit tough for some people uh, to see, I will see if I have time to zoom in on this part once we go into post-production on this class, but uh, there's these little white boxes at the corners of the image. You'll also see them here uh, in the center portions too. And so just like with any image, uh, you'd see the same thing here in other programs. You can click and drag and make that image smaller or larger, just obviously understand if you go above 100%, you're going to start to distort your image. So if you need to do a little resizing here, that's a really easy trick that you should be aware of. Okay. When you are using the arrow key, one thing you'll notice, like right now, I can't like just go off and do something else. Up here at the top right, there's an OK button that I have to hit. You can also hit the Enter key, by the way. It does the same thing. Okay. So now we have our image. So now we can start to play with it. Probably in my, for me, one of the most helpful tools is this next tool right here at the top left. This is the magic wand tool. By the way, hotkey if you ever want to use this. Not everyone uses hotkeys in Pixelmator, but it's the letter W. So the magic wand is a smart selection tool. So let's say for whatever reason, I want to remove the sky in this image. Okay, I want to get rid of that so it's transparent. I could just click in this area here. It's going to be a little tough because we have water right below it. That's a very, very similar shade. But you'll notice that as I start to drag, it's selecting that sky. And the more I drag it out, the wider it grows. Okay, so right there is about what I can get away with with one click. And when I let go, 
you'll see that it's got those little lines kind of going around it. So that just means that that area is now selected. So if I wanted to clear it out, for example, just hit the delete key and it's gone. So now to clear out the rest of the sky, I would just need to do a lot of little touch up work over here, get this portion here gone. Okay, get this portion here. These little items, oops. This is where definitely uh, zooming in can definitely be a, a handy feature. Shortcut, by the way, to zoom in, in case of those of you who don't know, it's pretty standard on the Mac. It's Command Plus. Command Minus is Zoom Out. So just with that little work right there, I remove the sky. Now, obviously, there's a lot of little, little blips there. I would just use the eraser tool, touch it up, and then theoretically we'd be good to go. Okay, moving on. Next thing we have here, th these tools, I don't know if a lot of people really use them. I personally do not, but we have a couple of other selection tools here. So the first one is the rectangular marquee tool, and it just means that the shape that it's go way back up. The way it's going to select is just it is a rectangle. You can choose whatever size you want here, okay? Um, you'll notice that if you hold the shift key down, it makes it a perfect square. So when I let go of the shift key, I can make it any size, hold the shift key, and it immediately converts into a perfect square. Okay? Next one over here, very similar, but it's oval. Okay, so we can hold that down, hold the shift key, and you get a perfect circle. Next one over here, some people love this feature. I Maybe it's just because of the work that I do. I, I have not really found this to be that handy to me. Um, it's a little similar to the Magic Wand tool, uh, but this is called the Magic, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Paint Selection tool. So with this, let's see if I can find an example here. Let's say I want to highlight the Pilgrim Monument over here, okay? Instead of doing the magic wand tool, with this what you can do is you basically are painting and it's going to try to intelligently figure out what it is you're trying to select. You notice I'm kind of moving around here a little bit. And this is usually the kind of thing you do not in just one stroke. You do this in multiple strokes, but right now I'm actually getting pretty lucky with it. Okay. So then theoretically, I just let go. You'll notice that it's all selected. If I hit the delete key, theoretically that would be removed as well. But we're not going to do that. Um, while I'm actually just doing that right now, it uh, brings me to another really, really important hotkey that everyone should know. This does not just apply to Pixelmator. Um, several of the hotkeys on the Mac are universal. They apply to different programs. Universal undo is command and the letter Z as in zebra. Now, if you go back in time, okay, and you realize, oops, you went too far, and you need to go forward in time. So let's say I delete all of this, okay, I undo it, and I was like, wait a minute, I actually want that to come back. You should also know how to redo. To redo, it's the exact same as undo, just add the shift key. So undo, moving back one step, is command Z. If you hit command Z multiple times, you go back an individual step in time add the shift key, and you go forward in time. Okay. Next one we have here is just the lasso tool. So for people who like to trace, this is your tool. So you can just manually select whatever it is you want to work with. You'll notice that as I start to click, it's creating these perfect lines. And when you're done, you would actually double click, and that will just kind of seal the image right there so it's locked in. Next tool we have here is the crop tool. I think everyone's pretty familiar with crop, but all you would do is with crop, let's say I want to just get it down here to the monument, I would just click and drag to the area that I want to be selected. It'll kind of give me a window as to where I am right now. If I need to adjust it, I can move this around. Just like with the arrow key, I can kind of trim it up a little bit here. And when you're done, you'll notice there is a crop button up here at the top right. Once again, you can just hit the enter key if you like. Next one we have here is not a tool that is commonly used these days. Um, Slice is a tool that was really popular back in the days of Dreamweaver, when people were using Dreamweaver to build websites. Dreamweaver still exists, but it's really kind of fallen off. It, um, WordPress is by far the standard these days. Um, and other services out there. Personally, I'm a fan of Weebly, but 
uh, where Slice, I know I used to uh, use this all the time. I used to design websites back when I was a teenager for companies. Uh, what I would do is use, I'd create one image, slice the image up, and then portion that off into a website. So I can make this portion here an image, make this portion up here a separate image. Not something a lot of you are going to probably be doing these days. The next tool we have over here is we have a, an eraser tool. Okay, uh, pretty standard. You know, you click and it erases. You'll notice with all the different types of brushes, whether you're dealing with a paintbrush or an eraser, up here at the top of my canvas, I have the different tools here to adjust, you know, how big this image is, how big the brush is going to be. So in this case, I would click that. That brings up the same thing that Command 4 brings up. And so I can tell it what size I would like it to be. So in this case, I go to 10, so make it a little bit smaller. Okay. You'll also notice, this is an important one to go over, we have a gear icon. So this isn't going to really apply so much to an eraser tool, but it is going to if you're going to paint. You have a whole bunch of different types of brushes. So for example, abstract, just to give you an idea of how that looks. Okay, it's not perfect, it's a little messy. Okay, so they have all these different types of brushes. You can explore them on your own time. Next one we have here is we have a brush tool. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, if you want to choose color, that would be right up here. If you look, there's a little box. It's on black right now. I'll change it to yellow so it's a little easier to see. But I can just paint in my color wherever I want. Let's go back in time. Okay. Next one we have here. Now this one, uh, gradient is very similar to this one down here, which is the, uh, the shape tool. Personally, I don't use gradient. I use the shape tool, but I'm going to show you regardless. So with the shape tool, hold on, let's deselect that image. Okay. You can add kind of a texture to your image. And where this all comes from is up here at the top of the of the canvas. So right now it's kind of set to this metallic look. You may notice if this looks a little bit familiar. I use this many times in the background of our starter images for YouTube. Uh, so you can give it like a purple, a purplish look. Okay. You can adjust the different angle of the light. Okay. It just makes it a little bit more interesting than say a white background although I've been known to do that occasionally too. Uh, we have the different metallic options here. So give you a, kind of a silver aluminum feel to it. We have a rainbow version. Okay. You can really kind of experiment with this. You can also create your own. Okay. Um, so you can go here into show gradients. You'll see all of them down here at the bottom now. Let's just bring up the gradient toolbar. And there's different types of light that you can use. You can use linear Okay, kind of gives you an idea of what linear looks like. Radial, which is just a circular pattern. Or angle, which is I think what we started with right there. Okay, that's your different gradients. The paint can, I think everyone knows, if you have an area that you need to fill in, you can use that. Most people just use brush, but, you know, this in this case, I'm just telling it to select areas. I'm just holding down my cursor before I'm before I know it, I'm done with the whole image. Okay, uh, the next two here, I'm actually going to switch out and go to a different image. Give me one second here. An image of yours truly that has clearly not been touched up, as you'll see as soon as I zoom in. So the next tools that we have here, and if your toolbar does not look identical, don't worry. I will show you how to get it back in just a moment. So we have these two little icons here. This may not appear for everyone, the main one I want to go over is this one right here. The name of this tool is called the Pinch Tool. This is similar to Liquify in Photoshop, for those of you who are familiar with Photoshop. Um, so let's say, for example, and I am not a graphic designer by any means. I'm not professional. This is not what I do full time for a living. I'm going to zoom into my face here. And let's say I need to shrink that honker of mine. Okay. Well, I can use this tool here. And the the trick with this tool is it's a lot of little clicks. You're not going to hold it down. Otherwise, you're going to look like an alien. And it'll just kind of pinch the image back. Okay? So I can just kind of fine tune it, get my nose a little smaller. My nose is fine, but I just want to show you how it looks. You can do the same thing with the ear. Okay? And I'll just kind of tuck everything in. It's easy to go crazy with this tool. So you may be using the undo feature a lot. Okay? 
but you can kind of see an idea of how it looks there if I hit undo a bunch of times. That's our original image. I'm just hitting redo. That's our after image. So if you're trying to tighten your butt or any other body parts, that's what you're going to do. The other one I wanted to show you is this tool right here. And you'll notice there's a little, might be hard to see, there's a little teeny tiny arrow next to it, okay? That's because this tool has multiple options, okay? This is warp, bump, twirl, and smudge. Some of these you might use, some you might not. So bump, if I remember correctly, basically does the exact opposite. If you want to make something bigger, you know, like ladies, you might want to make, of course, your fingers. Why, where were you going with that? A little larger, you could put this really anywhere. Once again, yes, you can go crazy with it. You can give yourself alien eyes. Okay, so if you want to look like a total freak who's tripping on acid, there you go. <laughs> This is really doing wonders, I'm sure, for my image. Uh, twirl, kind of a silly thing. It just kind of twirls the image here like a pinwheel. Uh, smudge. Uh, artists, anyone who uh, is maybe dealing with artwork, this is kind of funky. I'll do this on my shirt so you can kind of see. But it looks like this is oil on canvas and you're just smudging it. Okay, that's what that tool does. Uh, the next two, I'm going to just hit undo a million times so I can get back to something I can really work with. The next two tools here, really handy, especially when you're dealing with people. Okay, we have dodge, and next to it we have burn. Uh, example of dodge, um, actually with dodge I think you'd use that more with landscapes. So sometimes when you're taking a photo you have an area uh, of the photo that's dark and you want to make it a little bit lighter, that's where dodge is going to come in handy. Um, with burn, it's going to make it a little bit darker. So let's say you just got back from vacation but you spent the whole vacation inside, but you want to make it look like you were outside. Burn will give you your perfect tan that you didn't have. And hopefully with less chances of skin cancer too. So with the burn tool, uh, once again, I have all my different options up here at the top. One thing that's really easy to get carried away with with burn is watch the exposure because if you go really high, watch what happens. Yeah, now I really look like I have been actually set on fire. Let's undo that. Let's bring it down to maybe 14%. You'll notice we get a nice little tan effect here, okay? Just make sure you do it really evenly. Right now I'm being very messy. So if I want to make it look like I have a little bit more of a tan than I actually have, that still looks pretty cancerous right there, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm going to be hurting that night. Neutrogena, thank you very much. So <laughs> there you go. looks like I fell asleep in the sun, but you'd probably do it to a slightly less extent. So for that, just make sure you watch how big your brush is, okay? If you're doing something like a tan, you really want to use a big brush, okay? Oh, sorry, I was on 125 there. I might want to maybe manually increase it a little bit. Ooh, big, big trick for all of you. See the size of the brush right here? I'm going to put over my hair just so you can see it a little easier. I want to show you manually how to make it a little bit larger or a little bit smaller. Look at your keyboard. Next to the letter P, you have two brackets. The one that is immediately to the left of the P will make your brush smaller, and this applies on any brush. Could be the eraser, could be paintbrush, could be dodge or burn. If you do the one next to that, it'll make it larger. So now if I want to, you know, really just kind of give this a little light touch up, I can just whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. maybe not that last one. Just a light. There you go. Instant tan. Very, very simple. You'll also notice that up here we have different um, methods to apply this. We can have the range be set to highlights, midtones, or shadows. You can just experiment with that, see what works best for your image. Uh, to give you an example of, I want to, I don't want to neglect dodge over here. So for example, with dodge, if you look at this little section of the photo, it's a little bit dark. Okay, I can just click a little bit and just lighten it up a little bit. the different dark areas. Uh, just again be careful not to over apply it because when you do that's what it looks like and that'll be very noticeable is not probably the best type of manipulation. Next two, uh, let's see, I am going to, I'm looking at what people, 
Okay, let's go over uh, the next one we're going to do. Uh, for people who are interested in retouching photos, these are two of your best friends, okay? The next two is we have a clone stamp tool and we have a repair tool. Um, I think to go over the clone stamp, what's going to be a good example? Well, I don't really care about the uh, application here. I just want to show you how to do it. I'm going to zoom in on this image and try to give you an example here. Let's say for some strange reason, I want to extend this um, jetty out here. Jetty? I'm blanking on the term. One of the ways you could do it is use the clone stamp. And the way you're going to do this is you have to, on your keyboard, hold on, I need to just kind of adjust my microphone here so I have a little bit more space. Okay. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to hold down the option key for where you're going to be dealing with. This may or may not be the best example I could choose in the world. I'm going to make the size of the tool a little bit smaller. So what you're going to do is hold the option key over where you want to clone. Okay, this is going to be the source. So then you're going to click down. And now as I move my cursor, you'll see I have like what was just in my cursor there now extended. So I could just click here. If I can just a little bit get it down. We're not going for perfect quality here, but I could extend this as much as I want. Okay, that's basically how the clone stamp tool works. For me, the one that I use more than anything on here is spot healing. And for that, we're going to switch over to the other layer. Okay, this image of me completely untouched up, clearly. Okay, see that little ding right there, okay, by my nose? So this is an example where the, um, where the spot healing tool is going to be perfect. It just kind of, you tell it what area to look at. It's going to compare the pixels around it, and it's going to attempt to kind of even everything out. So I just have to put my cursor over that little blemish, click, and it's gone. Okay. Uh, when you do this, this is another example where you want to do, instead of kind of drawing on it, you're going to do a lot of little clicks. Okay. So if I go up here to my forehead, okay, little spot there we can get rid of right there. You can just use this to really retouch all the different parts of your photo. Neck. In the case of, switch over here. When you're dealing with a landscape, uh, so for example, I just cloned in and I have all these boats now. If I could just click here, I can just remove each of those boats. Okay, very, very simple. Uh, this is perfect for if you have trash in the background, say you're you know, taking a photo of your family on a field. If you want to remove the trash in the background, just clean it up. You can use this to remove people in the background. Um, it doesn't work perfectly. It's not like content aware in Photoshop, but it does a really, really good job overall. Next tool we have here, I don't have an example for you, but I think it's fairly obvious. It's red eye reduction. You would just simply uh, place your cursor on the center of the pupil adjust the brush size so that it makes up that whole pupil and click. If it doesn't do a perfect job on the first click, you can keep clicking. I never have very good success, I have found, with red eye reduction. I find that inevitably I always make my subjects look high because as I click it, their pupils get larger and larger. And for those of you who have ever indulged, you know where we're going with this. Next tool we have here is the magic eraser tool. Okay, um, So for that, let's see if I can give you it's a little, yeah, it works similarly to the way that the uh, magic wand tool works. I have not found that it works that well, personally. Again, I'm a big, big fan of the magic wand, not so much the magic eraser, but it's uh, just a little bit of a hybrid, if you will, between magic wand and the standard eraser. Uh, next tools that we have here, uh, good one, let's switch back over. If you want to kind of touch up your skin, make it look a little bit uh, cleaner, this is another great little tool here, is we have a blur function here. So one way to give your skin that really smooth look is just to add a little bit of blur. Notice once again, we have the strength options for this particular brush at the top. I'm going to take it down so it's really subtle. You do not want to do too much of this or it's just going to be, it's going to be very obvious. One of the basic rules in skin retouching is you really want to avoid softening your hair, your lips, your eyes, your eyebrows, and your teeth. Because in those areas, you want those to be sharp and crisp. Uh, but with the skin, you can just kind of 
give it a little bit of an airbrushed look with this. If you want to really touch up your skin, that is several, several steps. Eventually one day we'll put together a little uh, class on that. Sharpen tool is right next to it. So if you accidentally, if you want to have an area of your photo that you want to enhance, just make it really well defined. Maybe I want to make my teeth really well defined. Okay, I can just kind of go over that with the sharpen tool. I don't know how well you're going to all see this, but it really kind of makes them stand out there. You can do the same thing with your ears, your hairline, just to make it not look quite so photoshopped. Oh, another area to be aware of when you're using the blur tool, avoid the nostrils. Very easy area to accidentally hit. Next here we have two different pen tool options. Uh, the first one we have right here on the left is, I believe, wait for the name to pop up, I think it's just your standard pen tool. Yeah, just standard pen. So with this you can just click and you can notice you can create curves. Okay. If you click and hold down, that's how you create those curve images. Okay. I'll get rid of that. The next one here is more of a freehand tool. You'll notice that even if my movements are kind of jagged, it kind of smoothens them out when I'm done. Okay. So if I've got a curve going, it kind of rounded it off. Oops. Next tool we have here, I noticed uh, in the, when I was asking people who were here a little bit early, uh, what they wanted to learn how to do, a bunch of people said they wanted to learn how to do text. T for text, right down here, oops, where's my cursor? Right down here, okay, you can just basically click and drag to add in your text. So I could put down here, this was actually from a cruise, so I could just double click in here. Okay, when you double click on text, it highlights just like you would if you were in a Word document. I can say, you know, greetings from Italy. Now you'll notice that it went off the screen there. That's because my area here for text is only this little box. So if you ever run into that problem, just go into the arrow tool here. You have your little boxes around your text and you can just drag it out. And as you do, you see that you can see the whole thing. You need to modify any of your text. Just double click on it so that it's all highlighted. Actually, it's usually triple click to get it to completely highlight. And you'll see that you have all your different options here at the top. So if I want to change the font, uh, I'm a big fan of Avenir. It's uh, the font, for those of you, if it looks a little familiar, it's the font that iOS 7 uses. Um, Apple has really gravitated towards this font. Um, so I'm a big fan of that one. They have different versions. I really like the ultra light version of it. You have your bold options, etc. up here, justification. And if you want to change the color, that would be right here. So if I want to put this over my shirt, okay, there you have that. Now at this point, what I want to do is I want to mention something that I think a lot of people here probably have questions about, which has to do with layers. As you start to compose an image, if you have multiple elements here in your image, you are going to end up creating layers. So think of it as if it were just a stack of actual photos. Say you're doing a collage, you would have layers of photos. And some of those images you want to be on the very top, and some you want to be on the bottom. Well, if you look over here at the right-hand side of my screen, we have our layers window. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Don't you just love when you when you sneeze during a live class? They don't do that on TV. Okay, so over here, if I, for example, had added text and it looked like that, where did my text go? Well, if you look here, the text is beneath my image. So all you have to do is drag it and drop it to the top. And as you start to compose different images together, you may need to do some moving around. Uh, it'll just kind of help you. Another one that's important to know, um, I don't have a great example to give you right now, but it has to do with this portion right here, which is the opacity. So, for example, if I want both images to be seen here, okay, again, this is not a real example, I can take the opacity here from the image on top and start to drag down the opacity, and as I do that, you start to see the other image until finally I hit zero, and it's completely transparent. Drag it back up, and I have it there. The next one here, and I see a few people of you, so those of you who are here in the class wanted to know about this. The next one here, this is the one that I use um, for all of our graphics that I do for PC classes online. This is to create shapes, and specifically I use this with gradients. So what I want to do is I'm going to actually create a new image for all of you right now. 
And the reason why is I know we do have some people here who are interested in graphic design, and I want to give you all a bunch of little tips that I use personally to help you with that process. The first thing I always start with when I'm designing a graphic for a poster or an image for our YouTube channel, for example, is the background. So for this, I use the shape tool. You can see here if you click and hold on it, you get all these different shapes here. Also, if you go here into custom shape, you'll see a whole bunch more. So if you just need like a little, um, you know, butterfly, whatever you might need, it's all here pretty much. You can also, of course, grab shapes from the web. That's going to be a trick I'm going to show you in a little bit. Most common shape I use, though, is rectangle. And so you're just going to click and drag. And as you do that, you'll create your gradient image. If you do not see a gradient, look up here at the top of the canvas where it says fill. It can be none color, so that would be just solid color, or gradient. So with this, you can choose any of these options here. Okay, we have a black metallic. It's kind of sexy. I like that. Um, some of you may notice that, and I, I didn't even mean to do this, there's this really ugly black border around. I uh, don't know why that's here. That's here where it says stroke. Okay, so if you see that and you don't want to just hit none, and that will disappear on you. Okay. Um, you can add a shadow. I don't know why many of any of you really would, because this is just your background. But anyways, you have that there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you exactly how I create one of the images that I use for uh, for our YouTube videos. One of the formats you should all be familiar with is a PNG file. A PNG file just basically means that the image has a transparent background. This is really helpful if you're grabbing graphics off the web. Now, as far as the legality of doing this, I cannot give you advice. I am purely showing you how to do this. It's not something that many people or anyone that I know of cares about because it's on the web. It's public information out there at this point. Um, but sometimes if I need a little graphic, for example, if I'm promoting Pixelmator, I don't think the company's going to mind. Okay, what I would do is I would usually hop on my web browser, which I now have to move to the screen. And one of the tricks I use is I use Google Images. So instead of just searching Google on for a website, you can go to the website images.google.com. And now you are only searching Google for images. That's it. So if you ever need a graphic for your website, this is what I have done in the past. I've done this with some clients. Um, this is not a good idea to use with photography because at photography at that level, you can start to deal with copyright issues. So just proceed with caution on this one. So let's say I need Pixelmator's logo. The way I would grab that image is I would actually type in the word Pixelmator and then I would actually add in the letters P and G. So now when I do that, let's say I grab this first image here. Okay, if I click on it, I want you to notice what happened to the background. It started off as white up here. If you can see the background there, and now we've got that same checkerboard. Great feature of Pixelmator. I can just drag this window over, take their graphic, drag it, and drop it, and there it is on my canvas. So now I can do whatever I want with it. Probably the first thing I would do in this case is resize it. So I'd grab one of those corners and just drag it back a little bit. Okay, so it's an appropriate size. And hit the OK button here at the top. That's one trick for getting images. You can use Google Images for just about anything out there. Like I said, just be careful not to use copywritten images. If it's public domain, go for it. Just proceed with caution. So if I was creating one of our images, I would at this point add in a little bit of text here. Okay, so I would drag on to my image and type in Pixelmator. This is not going to be the actual image I use, by the way. Shrink it down, change the font up here to something a little bit smaller. When you're done working with your image, okay, you're going to want to export it. Okay, when you go to export it, you're going to go to File and Export. If you save, it saves it as a Pixelmator file. And I'm going over export for a reason because I want you to see how flexible the software is. So, right off the bat, you'll see here we do have JPEG as an option. We have PNG, so if I wanted to keep the background, in this case, a transparency, it would do that. Notice that as I go from JPEG to PNG, the size of the file. 
JPEG, very friendly file format, 1.64 megabytes. Go to PNG, and it goes up to 2.9. TIFF is a form of a raw image, okay? It's very, very high resolution. You can choose to use compression or not. Notice, again, the file size. If I turn compression off, 12.02 megabytes. So for anyone who is a professional photographer and really, really needs to maintain the quality, you should be exporting it as a TIFF image or a Photoshop image, depending on what you're going to ultimately do with your image. And uh, you may want to turn compression off. Again, it all depends on what you're going to do with your image. Photoshop document, okay, boom, that takes it up a notch to 35 megabytes. PDF or other. Other is just the less popular formats that pretty much no one uses anymore. BMP, GIF, those were very big 15 years ago. Not so much anymore. Um, also, I want to note something that I accidentally misspoke about in the last live class that we taught on this, which is that you can use Pixelmator to open raw images, okay? So it's a great, another feature, once again, that gives you a lot of flexibility. If you're using a high definition camera, you know, great. You can take your photo with your camera and manipulate it within Pixelmator. You don't need to buy necessarily Photoshop. Um, a lot of the techniques that you're going to, most people are going to want, you can do right here within Pixelmator. Um, down here at the bottom, we have two remaining tools here. We have a spyglass icon, which personally I never, ever use. It's just going to zoom in wherever you click, okay? Um, I don't because I just use Command Plus and Command Minus. It's just my preference. We also have an eyedropper tool. The eyedropper tool is for when you need to identify an exact color. So let's say I need to identify the exact color, in this case, of the sunset here in the background, okay? You'll notice that as I click these different colors here, watch this color box right here. So as I click right here, it goes blue. As I click right here on the sunset, it goes yellow. So for example, if I needed to now recreate that, you know, I could use that color code and uh, figure it out, do whatever I want with it. Okay, a couple of other things I want to show you here. We're going to close out of this image at this point. And uh, let's go back to our landscape photo here, drone photo. Let's uncheck that. So I want to talk a little bit about the effects browser here. Now the effects browser, once again, that you get to by going to Command 3 on your keyboard. That's the little shortcut. We have a whole ton of different effects that we can add onto either an image or onto a layer. So if I had multiple items here on top of each other, I could apply the effects to one individual layer or the background. The way you define where it's going to apply is it all has to do with what is highlighted under layers. So for example, if I have my face image here, this is not going to be a good example, I can already tell, let's zoom back. Okay, so let's say, I'm just going to kind of move this off to the side. So let's say I want to add a motion blur to my face. I need to make sure that the background layer here, which contains my face, is selected at the time. All you have to do to apply any of these effects is just drag it and drop it onto the image. Now with pretty much all these, when you do that, you're going to get a series of different options that are specific to that particular tool. Uh, motion blur, used very often when you want to make something look fast if you're shooting a you know, racing car, for example, you can use that. Gaussian Blur, you're going to find if you, for example, search on YouTube for tutorials on how to give yourself the model quality skin. Gaussian Blur plays a big part of that. Um, and it's a, quite a few steps to, to get to that kind of quality. But uh, you'll find that pops up there. We have different categories of effects. We have distortion, okay. I'll just kind of give you a few examples here. So if I see it kind of distorts it there, gives it kind of a little almost like a wormhole effect. We have sharpen options here. Again, this is going to apply to the entire layer. Color adjustment. This one, uh, we start to get into color adjustments. These are going to be important for photographers. Um, specifically, as I scroll down here, hue. One of the features, uh, kind of, I don't quite understand why they did this, but one of the most important tools for photographers, if you really want your colors to just pop, 
off the screen has to deal with using saturation and be very careful with saturation because you don't want your image to look to look manipulated when you get to that le level for most people not for everyone you know it just it looks fake it loses its authenticity you know just don't overuse it but the settings for the ability to saturate your image are actually here under hue so I would drag that onto my image and you'll see here that I have the different options here for saturation. If you drag it to the left, it's going to make it eventually go black and white. If you drag it off to the right, be very careful. See, if I go too far, it just looks crazy. But if I go just a little bit, you know, not bad. Colors kind of pop a little bit. And you can adjust the lightness of this image. Okay, usually I just leave that kind of alone. Maybe I'll bump it up 1% or 2%, but nothing, nothing dramatic. You can go to all the different colors here and adjust them individually. That's just by clicking on the colors up here and you can kind of go through them one at a time. Okay, that's that. Uh, scrolling down here through more of the effects, we get into some of the crazy stuff here. So if you're trying, trying to create like a crazy background, you know, you can get into some of these. These remind me of a kaleidoscope. So for example, I could take, well, here we go, kaleidoscope, drag it onto the image, looks crazy. Okay, you'll also notice that this might be a little tough to see. We have actually a circle here where it's attaching the effect and kind of move this around the image and it'll just manipulate, change the way it looks. Okay. Go crazy with it. Bunch of other little crazy effects there. Stylize options here. Some of these are really nice. Um, I love this one right here, Light Leak. If you want to kind of give it that old vintage type look to it, uh, this is perfect for that kind of thing. So for this, I can just drag this onto my image and check it out. It's like that 70s look to it. See what I mean? And once again, we have that gray circle. So I can move this effect around the image. And we actually have, if you notice, we have a circle here. And then we have a black dot that's on an axis here. So you can really change how the light leaks within this photo. So if you want to just do the corner, kind of looks like we've got a little bit of a sun flare effect going on here. Not really sunflower, more of an exposed, overexposed look. And within light leak, we have different types of light leaks. Definitely a very cool effect. I think a lot of people out there are going to like this one. Okay, Orion, that really is your, more than anything, that's your uh, sun flare effect. Scrolling down, we have a few other kind of, again, very funky ones. We have a couple of items here, like halo and sunbeams, starshine. Um... You can just really get creative with this. Uh, fall, which I think just kind of makes it look like your images from the movie 2001. Okay. A whole bunch of different things you can do here to just make it look crazy. I'll use these many times. These light, these different types of light leaks, I will use as background images. So um, I'll layer my text over. It just kind of gives it a little bit more appeal than just a black background. So big fan of light leak. Uh, the different options there and fall. Okay, you can go through them. There's a whole bunch of them there. They're a lot of fun. Okay, um, and that's your effects window. A couple final little items I want to go over here before we start to wrap things up and I answer the people's questions who are here live right now is I want to go here into the preferences. Okay, in preferences, we don't have a heck of a lot, but one of the things you can change here is let's say you don't want your images by default to be transparent. You can choose them to have a white or a black background. Okay, so if you deal a lot with black background images, instead of having to add a layer of just black, you can just keep it that way. Tools. This part is really important. Again, some of you may notice that my toolbar might look a little bit different than yours. You can customize this thing. And to do it, this is where you're going to go. So under tools, we have different tabs. We have your basic, selecting, painting, retouching, and drawing. So let's say, for example, we didn't go over sponge. I never, ever use sponge. But if I wanted to add it, I could just drag it and drop it over here. You'll also notice that if you start to add more and more, it will drop down and add more and more tools. So if I need constant access to pencil, for example, I can drop that in there too. Okay, and it'll just snap right in and it'll stay there. Also very handy uh, if you're a graphic designer, rulers. Uh, you can set it to be by default in inches, pixels, centimeters, millimeters, points, picas, I've never even heard of that, or percentages. So I per personally I prefer inches, but 
You can do whatever you want. You can tell it how often to place your grid items here. Close that out. Oh, another trick I did want to show uh, for people who are uh, designing graphics that are going to have text within them. Uh, let me just throw some text on here just so I have something to work with. Just make it a little bit bigger. Some people may have noticed that in some of our images uh, we have like a little reflection here. I want to show you how to get that. If you go here under view, I may have to remind myself which one it is. I believe it's under, is it styles? It is. Oh, I got lucky. So if you want to bring up styles right here, uh, the shortcut for this is command 7. So if you really care about the ones I've showed you today, it's command 1, 2, 3, and 7. And so this is where I can add, for example, a reflection right here. I got a really. Oops, don't know why it's not doing that. Do I have it layered out wrong? Anyways, you can add a reflection in. Oh, here we go. I don't know why it's not doing it. Anyways, normally <laughs> that always seems to work. Of course the problems happen when you're live, right? You can add your shadows right here to your text. So if I turn off that background, you'll be able to see this part here. Oh, there is a there is a reflection there. It's just very, very light, very hard to see right now. Um, if I want to add a shadow, you can up it to however many pixels you want. You can change the angle of it. Let's make that text a lot larger so you can all see it. 400 size font. Okay, so I can add a shadow to it, choose how what kind of angle I want it to have. You'll notice as I rotate that little wheel, it changes it up. Also, you can change the stroke of the text itself. So if you want your text to have a gradient attached to it, this is where you're going to go for it. So I could kind of throw in you know, different types of gradient textures. Change this up. Go to blue. So there you go. So at this point, what I would like to do, I hope you've enjoyed this class. A couple of little quick things I want to mention. Uh, for the people who have been watching this video on YouTube, I hope you've enjoyed it. Make sure, you, if you don't mind, clicking that little thumbs up, like button beneath the video. We really do appreciate that. Also, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. That is the only way to find out as soon as a new video of ours comes out. Uh, we usually do about two videos or so a week. Um, also, if you have not done so, you can join our website. It is a completely free public service at pcclassesonline.com. For those of you who are here live or for those of you who are watching online, um, PC Classes Online, as I mentioned, we are a free service and part of how we're able to do that is we have a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for our different seasons. We are currently trying to raise money right now for our 2015 season. You can go to the website gofundme.com slash PC Classes Online and uh, you can donate as little as 5 or $10. Um, all the way up to as much as you want. Corporate sponsorships are available starting at 500 And uh, that's all. So I hope you've enjoyed this. For the people who are here live right now, I'm going to uh, stick around for a while, answer all of your questions, and uh, hopefully get you all uh, feeling really, really comfortable with this software. And for those of you who have been watching this on our website or YouTube, I hope you've enjoyed it. This is David A. Cox with PCClassesOnline.com, and you all have a wonderful day. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.